Hello everyone and welcome back to a new video. So here we will talk about the neonatal cyanosis. So cyanosis is a common presenting complaint in neonatal intensive care units. And here we will talk about a definition, types, pathophysiology, differential diagnosis, and treatment of neonatal cyanosis. You can always skip to other parts of this video using the video chapters in the video description. So let's start with the definition and types of neonatal cyanosis. So cyanosis is a bluish discoloration of the skin and mucous membranes. And it is on two types. There is the peripheral type and there is the central type. Peripheral cyanosis is very common it occur to almost all the neonates. So it's a bluish discoloration of the distal extremities, the hands and feet of the neonate, while the rest of the body is normal in color, which is pink to white. So peripheral cyanosis in newborns for the first two days is normal, and it is called acrocyanosis. And it occurs due to immature control of vascular town in newborns. So the vessels in extremities in the hands and feet of the neonate stay dilated, which lead to vascular congestion and bluish discoloration. Because these neonates uh, can't contract their vessels yet, they have immature control of their vascular towns. And that's why they get acrocyanosis which is a peripheral cyanosis of their hands and feet. The second type is the serious type of cyanosis, and it is called the central cyanosis. And our talk in this video is gonna be mainly about that. So it's a bluish discoloration of the entire body, especially the tongue, mucous membranes, and trunk. So if you see a cyanosed baby, Make sure to check their tongue, their mucous membranes, and their trunk. If those are cyanosed, then this neonate have a central cyanosis. And the central cyanosis is caused by increase in the amount of deoxygenated hemoglobin in the newborn blood. So the problem is increase in the deoxygenated hemoglobin. And the central cyanosis is normal in newborns for the first five to 10 minutes only after birth. If it persists, then it requires immediate evaluation because it reflects a serious underlying condition that has to be managed fast. So remember with the acrocyanosis, we mentioned that it is normal for the first two days. Now the central cyanosis is normal only for the first five to 10 minutes of birth. After that, it is not normal and it requires immediate evaluation. So let's talk about the central cyanosis pathophysiology. So we mentioned that the peripheral cyanosis pathophysiology is that the newborn have immature control over their vascular tone and that's why they get peripheral cyanosis. Now, the central cyanosis have a different pathophysiology than that. So it occurs due to increase in the amount of deoxygenated hemoglobin, as I mentioned, in the blood due to many causes that will be discussed in the differential diagnosis chapter of this video. And the central cyanosis become evident at more or equal to three grams per deciliters of deoxygenated hemoglobin in the neonate blood. So this number is quite important to remember. So at more than three deoxygenated hemoglobin, the neonate would develop cyanosis. Now this number is different for adults. It's about five grams or more for them to develop cyanosis because remember they have bigger bodies than the neonate. But in the neonates, it's more or equal to three grams for them to develop cyanosis. And if you ask at which oxygen saturation this occurs, 
then the answer is variable. So there is no specific oxygen saturation you would see cyanosis at because cyanosis depend on the amount of, of deoxygenated hemoglobin as I mentioned and it also depend on the amount of uh, hemoglobin concentration in the body. So if the infant has a hemoglobin concentration of 10 grams per deciliters, their oxygen saturation has to reach to less than 70% for them to develop clinical cyanosis. So 70% reflects the amount of oxygenated hemoglobin. Uh, now, if you take out 70% out, out of the 100% of their hemoglobin concentration, there is 30% that is uh, still there. And the 30% would reflect the deoxygenated hemoglobin. The 30% of 10 grams per deciliter is equal to 3 grams per deciliter, which is the concentration of deoxygenated hemoglobin needed for clinical cyanosis to develop. Another example would be, so, if the infant hemoglobin concentration is at 20 grams per deciliter, their oxygen saturation has to reach below 85% for them to develop cyanosis. Because 85% is the oxygenated hemoglobin, and 15% of the 20 grams equals to 3, which is the number at which the clinical cyanosis would develop at. So I mentioned that for central cyanosis to develop, the amount of deoxygenated hemoglobin has to increase. And there is five possible scenarios for the deoxygenated hemoglobin to increase, thus leading to cyanosis. And the first scenario is hypoventilation, meaning the body can't bring enough oxygen to the lungs. An example for that is with asphyxia. So with asphyxia, there is, there is central nervous system damage that would affect the respiratory center and this would lead to weak respiratory efforts and this would lead to hypoventilation. The second scenario is that there is ventilation perfusion mismatch. So this time the problem is not enough blood reaching the lungs. An example for that is persistent pulmonary hypertension in neonates. In this condition, there is increased uh, pressure in the pulmonary vasculature that lead to the blood bypassing the uh, lungs leading to cyanosis. The third scenario is diffusion abnormalities. This time the problem is in delivering the oxygen across the alveoli and into the blood. So there is a problem in uh, the diffusion of the oxygen to the blood. An example for that is meconium aspiration syndrome. In that condition, the baby aspirate their meconium and this would affect the alveoli and would impair the diffusion of the oxygen across the alveoli. The fourth scenario is is related to oxygen transport. So this time the problem is in the oxygen being transported from the lungs and into the tissues. And example for that is methemoglobinemia. So the hemoglobin this time uh, can transport the oxygen in enough concentrations. And the fifth scenario is related to the heart. So this time the problem in the heart uh, example would be cyanotic heart diseases such as transposition of great arteries. In this condition, the pulmonary artery and the aorta are switched and the oxygenated blood can't reach into the systemic circulation and this would lead to cyanosis. Now let's talk about the differential diagnosis of the neonatal central cyanosis. So it's a wide differential diagnosis so there is a lot of conditions that cause that and those include hypoglycemia and sepsis. Those are the first two differential that you should think of because those are common and easily reversible. 
with hypoglycemia, there is not enough glucose reaching the cells, so they don't have enough energy, so that would lead to cyanosis. And with sepsis, there is a multi-organ failure, including the lungs, and this would lead to cyanosis too. Sepsis is the second most common cause of, of central cyanosis in neonates. And after the hypoglycemia and sepsis, then you should think of the cardiovascular and pulmonary related differentials. So the cardiovascular system related differentials is the cyanotic congenital heart diseases, example, transposition of great arteries, tetralogy of fallout, truncus arteriosus, and so on. And those should be identified uh, quickly. The second cardiovascular system related differential is the heart failure due to sepsis, myocarditis, supraventricular tachycardias, and heart block. So the cardiovascular related differentials is the third most common cause of central cyanosis in general. So after the hyperglycemia, sepsis, and cardiovascular related differentials, now you think of respiratory system related differentials. And the first one is the respiratory distress syndrome. Respiratory distress syndrome is the most common cause of central cyanosis in neonates. And it is caused by surfactant deficiency. So the surfactant is a material that keeps the alveoli open. So if there is a surfactant deficiency, the alveoli would close and that is when not enough oxygen is reaching the blood and this lead to a central cyanosis. So why I put the respiratory distress syndrome as the fourth differential that you should think of after hypoglycemia, sepsis, and cardiovascular related differentials? Well, that is because respiratory distress syndrome is easily identified it is associated with the grunting respiratory noises that is easily identifiable. You should Google this type of respiratory noise, the grunting, if you didn't hear it before. And then you think of transient tachypnea of a newborn. This is a self-limiting condition and meconium aspiration, which impairs oxygen diffusion. And you should also think of diaphragmatic hernia uh, this condition with the abdominal uh, contents would herniate to the chest uh, and this would increase the pressure inside the chest and would lead to respiratory failure. Uh, this is easily identifiable with x-rays. You also think of pneumothorax and it is identified by examination and x-rays and pneumonia of course as a differential and persistent pulmonary hypertension. The other differential that you should think of is related to the nervous system uh, and those include asphyxia and intracranial, intracranial hemorrhage. So with those conditions there is respiratory center depression and that is when the respiratory uh, efforts are low and this would lead to cyanosis and also neuromuscular diseases. So this time the respiratory muscles are weak and you also think of maternal sedative drugs like the mother taking sedative drugs like opioids or uh, sedative, sedative hypnotics because those pass to the baby and they also cause resp respiratory center depression and you also think of meningitis and there's also differentials related to the blood like blood loss polycythemia and methemoglobinemia now let's talk about the differential diagnosis related to the peripheral cyanosis. So we mentioned that the peripheral cyanosis or the acrocyanosis is normal for the first one to two days. And if the peripheral cyanosis uh, lasted more than 24 hours, more than the first day of after birth, then there is a specific differential that you should think of. Those include sepsis, cardiogenic shock, hypovolemia and exposure to cold air or water. And this is for the term neonates, for the neonates that are born uh, in term. If they are preterm, meaning they are born 
before 37 weeks of gestation, then they would have acrocyanosis for more than two days. So it would be normal for them to have acrocyanosis for more than two days. Now let's talk about what do you do if a neonate has central cyanosis on examination. So first you check the ABCs, the airway, breathing, circulation of the neonate, and you check the vitals, which include the blood pressure, the heart rate, the respiratory rate, and the oxygen saturation and temperature. If the oxygen saturation is less than 95%, then administer supplemental oxygen, and you assess for signs of respiratory distress, like nasal flaring, chest retractions, tachypnea, which is more than 60 breaths for neonates, and you also check for strider and grunting. And if those are seen on the baby, then you think of differentials related to the respiratory system, like the respiratory distress syndrome. If the neonate has weak, irregular, or absent respirations, then you think of differentials related to the heart and nervous system. And there is the hyperoxia test, which differentiate between cardiac and non-cardiac causes of cyanosis. You administer 100% oxygen to the baby for 10 minutes, and their oxygen saturation is checked after. If the saturation increases substantially, then the cause is pulmonary or CNS related. And if their saturation is still the same, then the cause is cardiac. And you also take full history from the mother. You focus on the pregnancy history, the birth history, and the medical history. And you do a complete physical examination of the neonate. Finally, let's talk about the management. So after checking the ABCs, the neonate may need respiratory support in form of bag mask ventilation or intubation. And you send the neonate for CBC, you check for anemia and lymphocytosis. Lymphocytosis uh, is an indicator for sepsis. And you also send for blood cultures, looking for sepsis, blood glucose, looking for hypoglycemia. You send for chest x-rays, looking for pneumothorax, heart failure, and you send for ECG and echocardiogram, looking for congenital heart diseases. And you manage accordingly. And with that, we reach the end of this video. Thank you guys for watching. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe. And if you want to support more, you can buy subscribing to the Patreon. Link provided in the description of this video. Thank you guys for watching. Peace.